You're listening to FMGRadio.com. Are you ready to take control of your physical, emotional, spiritual, professional, and financial health? Are you ready to experience great success in your life? Each week, join Dr. Diane A. Thompson and her guests for tools and strategies to help you take control of your health and inspire you to live your best life. Now here is your host, Dr. Diane A. Thompson. Welcome to Health Talk with Dr. Diane M.D. This is a show designed to inform and inspire you to a healthier lifestyle. I am your host, Diane A. Thompson, M.D., and as always, it is my pleasure spending time with you on this broadcast with the goal that you may learn something that may improve your health and or your life. I do want to remind you that the information provided on this broadcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended for diagnosis or treatment. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your health. Now, as you know, we've been doing this month-long series on breast cancer, and uh, we've had uh, several guests on who have shared really important information on breast cancer prevention, prevention of recurrence, of how to deal with the diagnosis and so forth. And my guest today was with us last week, Helene Waldman. She is a holistic nutrition educator with a passion for helping those with breast cancer. She's also a faculty member at Hawthorne University. She's a columnist a private practitioner, a consultant to breast cancer clinics and doctors, and a co-author of this book that I found to be so helpful and so filled with great information. The book is called The Whole Food Guide to Breast Cancer Survivors, A Nutritional Approach to Preventing Recurrence. Helene, I want to thank you for coming back and continuing with the second part of our interview. Welcome back. Well, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and and the information that you shared with us on the first part has been um, so, so, so informative, so much that we hadn't thought of. And uh, you ended by talking a little bit about organic food, or I should say a lot about organic foods, which is something that has been in the media. Many of us aren't sure whether we should or we shouldn't. And you gave some great advice in terms of, you know, if, if expense is what you're worried about, then perhaps something like a farmer's market where you, as you mentioned, cut out the middleman, and that may be helpful. I want you to mention once again, you talked about the website last time where we can find out about foods that are uh, the Dirty Dozen or the Clean 15. Can you just mention that again for our listeners? This week. Oh, sure. Uh, that is the environmental, uh, environmental Working Group website, and it's www.ewg.org. And I, I should mention at this point, because we also talked on the last show about uh, personal care products and how many toxins are in personal care products, and on that same site, Environmental Working Group, there is a Safe Cosmetics database. And you can go in and you can look up the cosmetics that you're using and find out how they're rated by Environmental Working Group and how toxic they are or are not. So that's another service. That that is a great resource, yeah, great resource indeed. Now, some of the other things, um, because we we talked about some of the things that um, we know increase the risk of, of cancer, and I know another thing that had been in the media, we, we talked a lot about soy, um, and you heard different things. What, what's your take on soy and its relationship to breast cancer? Oh, well, soy is such a complicated issue. I'm sure you, you realize that. I'm sure your mm-hmm. listeners realize that as well, that some people say soy is the best thing since sliced bread, and other people say never, ever go near soy. So I take a position somewhat in the middle, I say, first of all, remember that 90% of soy is genetically modified. So if it's not organic, then it is off the table, (laughs) literally and figuratively. We do not want it on our table if it's not organic because that makes it genetically modified, that makes it toxic by definition. Uh, Okay, second thing about soy. Even when soy is organic, it 
it does have uh, some problematic elements to it. Of course, there are the phytoestrogens, and again, there's mixed opinion about that. I don't believe that the phytoestrogens in, in food, that is soy, are going to be problematic for breast cancer, although certainly I believe that if someone were to take a supplement of isoflavones, they could be. So I do try and steer people away from the soy isoflavone supplements. A little bit of tofu, a little bit of miso. I don't think we're going to have too much trouble from the phyto from the phytoestrogens. But soy also has other uh, problems with it. For example, in large amounts, it can inhibit thyroid function. And low thyroid, actually, is is a major risk factor for breast cancer. Um, It also has some enzyme inhibitors, which can disrupt our digestion. So I don't believe that a lot of soy is ever a good thing, whether you have cancer or not. I don't believe a lot of soy is a good thing. However, there are certain forms of soy that uh, disable the problem, the the goitrogens, which are the thyroid-disrupting parts of the soy, and the trypsin inhibitors, which which is the digestive uh, problems that the soy presents. Uh, The process that is used to disable those problematic parts is fermentation. So when you eat soy that's been fermented, so that would be tempeh, that would be miso is a great example, uh, natto, which is very popular among the Japanese. It's not eaten too much in this country, but it is sold in Asian markets. Fermented soy retains the health benefits, again, as long as it's organic, of soy without the problematic parts of the soy. So I'm kind of bullish on the fermented soy products, the organic fermented soy products, especially miso. Miso is very protective, and miso also has another great characteristic is in that it is radioprotective. So if people are receiving radiation therapy or exposed, taking a lot of mammograms or CAT scans, miso can help protect the cells from the damage uh, from radiation. So I do like that. So I say soy, as long as it's organic and if it's fermented, is fine. If it's not fermented, I would say be very moderate with it. And if it's not organic, never. That's interesting. I did not actually know that 90% of soy is genetically modified. Yeah. I didn't yeah, I didn't realize that. Okay. So, um and, and I know we we talk a lot about um the nutrient the toxins that are out there that um can encourage cancer in a sense and put you at risk for cancer and its recurrence. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about some of your favorite nutrients that may help to lower the breast cancer risk. Okay. Well, I did mention iodine before, so I will start with that one. Um, Iodine actually used to be known as somewhat of a universal nutrient. You know, in the old days of medicine, and you might have studied this, you know, it was used as an antibiotic and an antiseptic and all, all kinds of things. Iodine is actually essential for every cell in the body, but in, in, in women, it's particularly critical for breast cells to behave normally. And, it's, and in everyone, it's critical for thyroid function because you need iodine in order to make thyroid hormone. But women have an additional need for iodine because of the breast tissue, and breast cells have the unique need for iodine. Uh, What it actually does is it uh, desensitizes the estrogen receptors in the breast, and it helps to reduce estrogen production in ovaries if that's what's required, it also reduces fibrocystic breast disease, and I have seen that in many, many clients with the addition of some iodine in the diet, those breast lumps, those fibrocystic breast lumps just go away. In an existing cancer, in uh, studies that have been done, iodine also was capable of causing some cancer cell death. We call that apoptosis. It slowed down cell division, and it also reduced blood vessel growth to tumors. So it has a lot of anti-cancer functions, and it also, in another rat study, prevented the rats from getting cancer when they were fed the toxin DMBA. 
there's a, a doctor in, I think it's Michigan, Dr. David Brownstein, who wrote a book called Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. I believe that's the name of the book. In that book, he says, the great quote, he says, you cannot give breast cancer to rats that have sufficient iodine. Now, I don't know if that's literally 100% true, but it's a very powerful uh, phrase, isn't it? So uh, iodine is very, very important, and we tend to think, well, our salt is iodized, so why would be, we be lacking iodine? Well, most of us are very deficient in iodine. First of all, our salt is iodized with iodide, which is a form of iodine, but not the form that our breast cells need. Our, fre- our breast cells actually need iodine, not iodide. So it doesn't help our breasts. And as I mentioned earlier, the fluoride and the chlorine in the water compete with iodine at the cellular level, at the receptor level. They kind of block the cells from taking in iodine. It's not only the fluoride and the chlorine, but one I didn't mention before that's ubiquitous in our environment is called bromide. And it's also a member of the halogen family. These are all members of a chemical family called the halogens. They're very similar molecularly. They kind of mimic one another. Well, bromide is in anything that's fire retardant. So it's in our it's in some clothing, it's in our bedding, it's in our furniture, it's in a lot of our how things in our household, it's it's part of the whole fire retardant chemical suite. Um, also, up until the 1960s, iodine was used in baked goods and breads as a, to help as a rising agent. It was replaced, I think it was the 60s or maybe the early 70s, it was replaced with bromide. Now, in California, we don't have bromide in our bread, but in most other states, bromide is ubiquitous in in loaves of bread. So, in other words, we're eating and consuming and drinking these competitors to iodine every day of our lives. And the iodine doesn't get through. And I do have a test I use with my clients. It's a urine test to see where they are at, where their iodine status is at. And i, I got to tell you, there was only one person, maybe I've done it 50 times, and there was only one person who did not come back deficient, and that wasn't me. <laughs> so, um, it, it's a it's a very widespread deficiency. Before uh, so you go on, before you go on to talk about the other nutrients that you like, so can you share with us some sources of iodine for our listeners out there who are looking to add uh, some of this to their diet? Well, the best sources of iodine are, are sea vegetables, really. And if you live on the East Coast, that's great because sea vegetables from the main coast would be ideal. You know, I'm a little suspicious now of sea vegetables from the Pacific because of, of Fukushima, but if you can get sea vegetables from the East Coast, that's wonderful. Seafood is rich in iodine. And some dairy products, depending upon, again, you know, where they were raised and what the composition of the soil is and whether or not they eat grass and all those things. But I'd say sea vegetables are probably your best source. I have to add to that, though, that in people who are significantly deficient, that's not going to be enough. So I frequently suggest that my clients may want to supplement with iodine in it, on top of that. Because when you become very, very, very deficient in minerals, and we we all are because of the deficiencies in the soil that I talked about. Um, you you have a lot of catching up to do. So oftentimes supplementation is the way to catch up. When we talk about supplementation, though, um, is there a risk of uh, too much of a good thing for someone who may decide to go out there and get some supplement? Yes, yes, there is. And it's more risky with certain supplements. So iodine is one of those supplements that, yes, eventually you could take too much. And also there's certain um, there's certain limitations on who should take large doses of iodine. People with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, should not be taking large doses of iodine. This is why it's very, very important to see either a nutritionist or an integrative physician who has studied nutrition or somebody who has actually really done the work on looking into these things because you need to be monitored. 
Iodine is one. Uh, vitamin D is another one. Vitamin D is terrific. But you know what? You can have too much vitamin D. And I, I get very nervous when my clients tell me that somebody told them to take 50,000 units a week and I'll see you next year. I go, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that is usually – that's not standard practice. So, yeah, people should not be doing that. That's correct. Yeah. So I, I think the, the take-home message here is nutrients – are like everything else. You know, they're good in the right amounts. Too little is is quite a problem, and too much can be a problem as well, and you really need to work with somebody knowledgeable about that and be tested for it and take the right forms and all that stuff. You, you need to work with someone who, who knows about this. Okay, great advice. What are, what are some other foods that or nutrients that you like? Well, I want to talk about selenium next I think the reason I think it's made it to number two or I, I you know I have so many number twos on my list so it's made it to one of the number twos on my list is because I recently uh, did some research into why are we also deficient in selenium I've, I've known for a long time from the research that adequate selenium is provides a degree of protection to breast cancer. In fact, it even provides a degree of protection to those with the BRCA uh, mutation in their gene. I was reading some research on that and discovered that uh, chromosome breaks in in people with the BRCA gene are are quite high, as we know, maybe uh, 40% higher than the average population, but when they have enough selenium in their blood, those chromosome breaks go down to about 2.5% more than the general uh, population. So selenium is very, very protective. We, we know that. We know that in animal experiment, experiments, those with the higher blood levels of selenium had less incidence of cancer. Of course, as you mentioned, it can be toxic at uh, very, very high levels. But at normal dietary levels, it's, it's, it's um, very, very helpful. But why are we so deficient in selenium? Well, one thing I discovered recently is that... Um, High fructose corn syrup actually contains large amounts of mercury, and mercury binds up selenium. So it drives your selenium levels down. And because so much of our standard American diet is loaded with high fructose corn syrup, it is pushing down our selenium levels to dangerously deficient levels. They're really, as I said, selenium and mercury are um, kind of, you know, they, they're kind of lovers. They have a strong bond. They have a strong affinity to one another. So when mercury is present, and it could be in the high fructose corn syrup, it also could be in your, in your fillings. Or it also could be in your, in your blood, you know, through uh, vaccine, flu shots and vaccinations. But when you have a lot of mercury in your system, it's going to bind up the selenium. This is so critical because selenium is one of the critical nutrients for the production of glutathione, which is our own internal antioxidant that protects our cells. And um, magnesium is also necessary for glutathione production. Some other things are as well, the amino acid cysteine, but selenium is critical. And so if we don't have enough of it, then our glutathione goes down and we have less protection. An interesting okay, let's stuff. take a, uh, Dr. Bowman, let's take a, a um, Dr. Waldman, let's take a quick break, and we will come back and just continue talking about selenium. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. This is really um, important information, so we will be right back. You're listening to the FMG Radio Network, where our motto is, have fun, make money, do good. We provide platforms to individuals who have a cause, message, or information that they would like to share with the world. If you'd like to join the FMG family and have your own radio show, please call us at 1-800-470-4982. That's 1-800-470-4982. We look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, my guest today is Helene Waldman and we are continuing with the second part of uh, our talk on 
preventing breast cancer recurrence and uh, we're looking at the nutritional approach to doing this and we uh, we are getting so much information from a book that she co-authored and the book is called The Whole Food Guide for Breast Cancer Survivors A Nutritional Approach to Preventing Recurrence and uh, just before the break she was talking about some of her favorite nutrients to help lower the breast cancer risk and she talked about iodine uh, we were talking about selenium. Uh, did you want to add anything else about selenium, um, Dr. Well, the only thing uh, that I want to say is that uh, we do know that the quantity of selenium in the soil tracks math- mathematically with cancer rates. So in epidemiological studies where they look at populations, they know that in areas with low selenium in the soil, there are higher rates of cancer, all kinds of cancer. Wow, okay, all right. Um, Any other nutrients you like? Oh, yes. (laughs) I think another one of my top nutrients has got to be magnesium. There is just, here's a quote that I, from Dr. Mark Serkis, who, who wrote a book called Transdermal Magnesium Therapy. He says, there is no substitute for magnesium in human physiology. There is a power and force in magnesium that cannot be equaled anywhere else in the world of medicine. So magnesium is critical for so many things in our body. People, uh, researchers have estimated anywhere from three to 700 enzymes depend upon magnesium to work properly. So if we're deficient in magnesium, that means that a whole host of our enzymes are actually not not working properly. That's going to have profound downstream effects on us. So let me tell you um, a little bit. I'll tell you about one study on magnesium and cancer, and then, again, we'll talk about, well, why are we so deficient in magnesium? So this one was a Polish study. And they looked at, um, they were looking at, well, first of all, one of the studies was looking at critically ill cancer patients, and they saw that almost all of them were low in magnesium. And in animal studies, we see magnesium deficiency has has caused uh, lymphomas. And um, we don't think of it as, an anti-cancer mineral per se, but because it is involved in so many things like lipid, fat metabolism, and the stability of our cell membranes and things like that, how can it not be um, involved with cancer? Because if our, our cell membranes are not in good health, that means we can't get the nutrients into our cells and we can't get the waste products out. So magnesium is, is critical for all of that. It's also, of course, in you know, heart disease, it's critical for the relaxation of the, the, art, the blood vessels and, and all kinds of things, the regular beating of the heart. But why are we all deficient in magnesium? Well, toxicity, medications, and the big one, stress. Stress depletes magnesium. And I don't know anyone who's not stressed. I don't know about you. I don't either. (laughs) I don't either. (laughs) I don't know anybody who's not stressed. And when I say stress, I don't just mean mental stress. I mean the stress of sitting um, on a polluted highway in your car, the stress of loud noise, the stress of bad food, any kind of stress to your system dumps, we dump magnesium and we excrete it. So we are very, 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 as a population, we are very deficient in magnesium, and it shows up in all kinds of ways. You know, people have restless leg and and heart disease and tremors and tics, and I'm not saying they're all caused by magnesium deficiency, but it's certainly a contributing factor because it's so critical in stabilizing all of these things. So we are all... um, deficient in magnesium. Now, it's important to know that magnesium is plentiful in green leafy vegetables and in unrefined grains and in most nuts. So there is a lot of magnesium out there to be had, but like iodine, I feel that many people are so deficient in magnesium that they need to catch up and that supplementation is really required because they're burning through the magnesium as quick as they can take it in. They're burning through it because of the stress. And a lot of medications 
as well. Blood pressure medications, a lot of heart medications, ironically, deplete magnesium just when it's needed for proper heart function. So one thing, I, a, a test that, that people can get is called a red blood cell, RBC magnesium. That is the best way to see what's going on if you've got adequate magnesium levels in your cells, not in floating around in the serum, but actually in your cells. So we look at that, and a level above six or so, according to Carolyn Dean, who's a magnesium uh, guru, she wrote a few books on it, she says a level of a, above 6.0 or so is what we're going for. The range says 4.7, I think, to 6.7, but we really want to be in the upper level of that range. We can test that, and um, we can supplement. Now, one of the problems with magnesium supplementation is it is also a laxative. That's another one of its functions. It helps the bowels to move. But when you supplement, it can help the bowels move a little too much sometimes. So there's forms of magnesium. A form I particularly like is called a jigsaw, which is a time release, and it doesn't have that effect on the bowels. So I do suggest, again, that people talk to a knowledgeable practitioner, get their magnesium levels checked, and if they need it, which I imagine they do, consider supplementing with a, uh, a form of magnesium that won't have an adverse effect on your bowels. And I agree with you. I think any of these supplements that people are considering, they really should check it out with someone who really knows what's going on so they don't end up over-supplement or using the wrong thing. And, you know, if it's okay, I'd like to add one thing which is not specific to cancer, but it's so important for women, which is that we're told over and over and over again, you know, to take your calcium, take your calcium, take your calcium for bones. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that calcium without magnesium and without its cofactors, without its family of nutrients, which really includes magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin K2, the calcium is not going to do us any good. In fact, I believe that calcium is doing us a bit of harm at this point because we're taking so much of it. And without the other nutrients, it goes into our arteries and, and causes hardening of the arteries. So that's another discussion, I realize. But just a word to the wise, don't take calcium by itself. It is not helpful. All right. And I, I wanted to jump to another area because I, I think this is so important in not just cancer but in so many things. But what's your thought on exercise in the role of helping cancer survivor prevent recurrence? Well, I think exercise is, according to the research, is very, very helpful. I think what's been the question is, you know, why is it so helpful? And we're just beginning to understand some of the reasons why it's so helpful. Um, one of the reasons, and one of my favorite reasons, is because when you exercise, you're utilizing more oxygen. And oxygen is... <laughs> is not a friend to cancer. Otto Warburg, who I mentioned in the last show, was the one who taught us back in the 1930s that cancer thrives in what they call an anaerobic or low oxygen environment. So the more we can oxygenate, get more oxygen in our blood, and when we move and when we, we breathe deeply, we're getting more oxygen in our blood. We're also boosting the effectiveness, the efficiency of our metabolism, so in doing so, that means that we're able to get rid of our wastes more readily, so our toxicity level is not um, getting as high if we can move our waste through. Sometimes exercise can help to make us more regular, and that's one way of getting rid of toxins, and sweating is another way of getting rid of toxins. And exercise also lowers our stress hormones. Stress hormones, like cortisol, have a similar effect, and, and um, epinephrine, which is um, adrenaline, have a similar effect to what I was talking in the last show, uh, like insulin. You know, they, they promote growth of cancer. So if we can lower those stress hormones and exercise will do that, um, then we take away another one of those growth factors. So those are just a few of the reasons why exercise is so helpful, both for prevention, again, and for our prevention of recurrence. And everything I'm talking about here is both. It's for mm -hmm. prevention in the first place and prevention of recurrence if you've had a cancer. 
I agree. And so my final question for you is um, I'd love to leave my listeners with a tip of the week. And uh, what would you say is the single most important action a woman could take to prevent breast cancer or the recurrence? You've given so many wonderful tips and so much information. What of all of those would you say is the single most important action? Oh, geez. That is a very difficult question. <laughs> As I said, because I have a lot of number ones. Um, I guess, you know what I'd have to say? I would have to say the single most important action is to empower yourself to learn, to take your health into your hands, because nobody cares as much about it as you do, probably, and understand why these nutrients are important, understand why blood sugar is important, understand why inflammation is important, and empower yourself to do everything you can for your own health because most of what's going to help prevent cancer is in your hands, not in anybody else's hands. You know, your doctor cannot prevent cancer for you. You and nobody can absolutely guarantee that, of course. But you're the one who can do the most things to reduce your risk as much as possible. So I think that is my number one, is empower yourself, learn, and take matters into your own hands. Get these tests done. See where and you I are. think that's uh, great advice for almost anything in life, really. You really have to empower yourself to learn more so you can do more. Um, my guest has been Helene Waldman, and her book uh, is The Whole Food Guide for Breast Cancer Survivors, A Nutritional Approach to Preventing Recurrence. Where can our listeners get a hold of your book, or where can they contact you? Well, they can go to the website, the book website, which is www.wholefoodguideforbreastcancer.com. If they want to contact me, let me say that one more time. It's www.wholefoodguideforbreastcancer, and that's all glommed together, one word, wholefoodguideforbreastcancer.com. There is a link right on that page that will take you right to the Amazon, um, take you right to the book on Amazon. If you if you go to the web page and click on the link, it'll take you right there. So that's how to get the book. If you want to find me, um, I, I would like to mention, if I might, that I, I do have a private practice. I work by Skype and telephone, so uh, people are always welcome to contact me for consults as well. And they can reach me through that website. Just click on the contact button and send me an email. And they can also find me on Facebook at Whole Food Guide for Breast Cancer. And they can go there and they can like the page. And once you like the page, you get the notifications of all the articles and the research studies and tips and things that I post there. And you can also write me a note. Great. And I will make sure that your link is also on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Dr. Diane A. Thompson. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You've provided such great information. And I, I, I mean, I've taken notes. I have a copy of the book. And for the listeners out there, it's definitely one of those that you, you take and you, you kind of highlight stuff and take notes at the corner because it's it's such a it's so filled with information. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate well, thank it. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. All right, you take care. And to our listeners, thank you also for listening, for tuning in each week. As I like to remind you, your health is indeed your wealth, so do something healthy for yourself. Uh, perhaps you'll look at some of the information given and have a discussion with your health provider. See what it is you need to add to your diet or remove from your diet. And uh, probably get a copy of Helene's book and, and really start to uh, empower Empower yourself with knowledge so you can take better care of yourself. So until I see you next time on the broadcast, you take good care of yourself. And as always, stay healthy. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to Health Talk with Dr. Diane MD. For show replays and full guest bios, please be sure to visit fmgradio.com forward slash Dr. Diane MD. That's D-R-D-I-A-N-E-M-D.